Welcome to our online worship service on this Palm Sunday. I'm Alan Akana, the Kahu or pastor of Koloa Union Church, and I'm really glad you've joined us today. As the threat of coronavirus continues and remains with us, we continue as a church to provide your worship service online. This is our way of staying connected as a church and also inviting others to join us for hope and encouragement during these sometimes difficult and very strange times. If you would like to support our ministry, I want you to know that we continue to need tithes and offerings at our church. And if you can, if you are able, I invite you to send in a check made out to Koloa Union Church to the church's post office box, which is PO Box 536, Koloa, Hawaii 96756. We really appreciate all of the gifts that can come in during these weeks ahead because we know that many of the people that are part of our congregation that normally give are unable to even receive an income for a while. So gifts to the church are especially important today. In addition, this is the time of the year when we collect the one great hour of sharing special mission offering of the United Church of Christ. This is the message or the gift that shares the message of God's love and hope for people in crisis. And if there's ever a time that the world is in crisis, it is now. If you are able to donate anything at all to one great hour of sharing, you can also write that check to Koloa Union Church and be sure to write in the notes section either one great hour of sharing or the abbreviation OGHS. I also want you to know that our church has taken on the task of sewing face masks for volunteers at KVMH, one of the local hospitals here on Kauai. If you are able to participate in this new ministry that we have, please see our website or call the church office and we'll make sure that you know exactly what it is that the hospital has been asking for. Today we commemorate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. As the people in the crowd laid branches on the ground and clothing as well on the ground before him and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let us worship God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come into God's presence, grateful for Jesus and his ministry among us. Let us give thanks for the one who, in humility and peace, entered Jerusalem on a donkey. Let us give thanks for the disciples who were obedient. Let us give thanks to the people in the crowd who honored Jesus by laying their cloaks on the ground before him and spreading branches from the trees ahead of him and following him into Jerusalem, shouting, Hosanna! and saying to everyone in the city, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. And finally, let us give thanks that today we participate in Jesus' vision for the world and carry on his mission of compassion and peace. Let us pray. Oh God, we come before you with gratitude for this is the joyful day we celebrate the vision and mission of Jesus. It is the day we honor his prophetic calling, and it is the day we remember those who honored him. Just as Jesus knew that there would be difficult and painful days of suffering ahead, we too know that there will be difficult and painful days just ahead of us and throughout the world and even in our own nation. And so even in our day of celebration, today on Palm Sunday, we, like Jesus, hold the suffering of the world within us. O oh God, prepare us for the days ahead. In our worship, give us wisdom, give us strength, give us peace, and give us compassion for all people. Amen. Today, our children will be reading our scriptures for us on Palm Sunday. Let us remember that it was the children who cried out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Okay. 
Today's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 118, verses 1 and 19 to 29. Listen for the word of God. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you. O Lord, O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and the Lord has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of altar. You are my God and I will give you thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. For the Lord's steadfast love endures forever. Today's gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 16. Listen for the word of God. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt near her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. He over turned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves and he said to them it was written my house shall be called the a house of prayer but you are making it a den of robbers the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he cured them but when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes, I have you ever never read out of the mouths of infants and your nursing babies. <laughs> you have prepared praise for yourself. Hosanna, happy Palm Sunday. My heart broke again this week as I was listening to the news and as I was reading the news. There's a woman, 19 years old, who delivered her baby in a hospital in Athens. She was tested positive for coronavirus. She lives in a refugee camp in the middle of Greece. 
As of Thursday, there were 23 others who have tested positive for the coronavirus there. It's a sad situation because they know that it's just getting started. And to make matters worse, the police have stationed guards all around the camp to make sure no one leaves. This camp has always been overcrowded, and now people are feeling the sense of the overcrowdedness more than ever. There's no place to go like there is here for many of us in America, and people are stuck living together in overcrowded conditions, knowing that this dreadful disease has come to them and it will spread, and they know it, and there's no place to go. There's a ferry boat docked outside of Athens, and on that boat there are 400 people looking for a place to get off the boat. They were denied that in Turkey, and now they're in Greece, hoping that they can at least get off the boat and go somewhere. At this point, over one-third of the people on that boat have been tested positive for COVID-19. In the Greek islands alone, there are 40,000 refugees who have fled their homelands, many because they knew that if they stayed, they would die, and this was years ago. And if coronavirus hits any of those refugee camps, most of the people really don't have any chance of survival. As bad as things are here in America, there are places around the world where it is much worse, where people are stuck together in overcrowded places, and they are forced to stay together, and they know they can't leave. As I reflected over the situation throughout the world this week, there's a couple things that came to my mind. First of all, I'm angry. I have been angry for a while because as of today, there are something like seven or 70 million refugees worldwide. And there are countries that can help a lot more. And our country and many other wealthy nations have been saying things like, it's not our problem. What if those people have a negative impact on our economy? What if a terrorist sneaks in along with some of them? Can't some other nation take care of this huge problem? And the excuses go on and on and on. And I keep thinking, we could have done more. And if we had, we would have literally been saving lives. So putting my anger aside for a moment, I also think, as my second reflection, I want to help. I want to do something. And even during those times where it seems like the problem is so overwhelming with so many millions of refugees out there, I still want to do something. And I continue asking myself, what can I do? And I know I can pray, and I've been doing that all along. And I know that many of you also pray. And I know that we've been praying for their well-being, for a place to call home, for safety, for health. But another thing that we can do right now is to support our denominations, One Great Hour of Sharing Mission Fund. One Great Hour of Sharing is the offering that we take every year in this church on Palm Sunday and Easter. And this year, during the month of April, once again, we're inviting people to participate in gifts, making gifts to One Great Hour of Sharing. It is the United Church of Christ's way of joining other denominations and our international partners in providing grace, compassion, and opportunities for health and healing for people all over the world. So these are the words that are found on the United Church of Christ, One Great Hour of Sharing website. The United Church of Christ works with international partners to provide sources of clean water, food and education and health care, small business microcredit, advocacy and resettlement for refugees and displaced persons, and emergency relief and rehabilitation. 
One Great Hour of Sharing also supports domestic and international ministries for disaster preparedness and response. I know that there is a lot that we can do. I also know that this is a really tough time for many people, but I have made out a check already to the United Church of Christ One Great Hour of Sharing Fund because I know that my little bit of difference combined with yours and so many others actually makes a huge difference. And there's the potential once again for millions of dollars to come in to help refugees, to help them resettle, to help them with health issues, and especially now as the crisis looms in many of the refugee camps with COVID-19. So I wanna help, and I know that you do too. The praying and also giving are two things that we can do, giving to the United Church of Christ one great hour of sharing mission fund. Another thing that our church has taken on is to make masks that KVMH Hospital has specifically asked for. And that is also on our website. So if you would like to help in any of these ways, I encourage you to do so. I'm not sure how many other ways we can help, but I know that creatively and as we work together, we will come up with other ideas and we will make a difference. So I'm praying, I'm helping. And my third reflection is I wanna see the world as God sees the world. I wanna see it as Jesus saw it when he was walking on earth among us. For the last few years, we've been hearing make America great again and America first. And many of us mean different things when we say those things and hear those things. But I am pretty sure that God is not in heaven right now when I consider all of the global pandemic and all the suffering throughout the world. I'm really certain that God is not in heaven saying America first. I'm absolutely certain that God cares about all people, that all people matter, Americans and others. Lately, I've been seeing posts on social media saying, let's not help anyone else until every need is met in America. And then once all of our needs are met, then let's consider helping others. My friends, I want you to know that this has never been the way of Jesus. Our hearts are bigger than that. Our compassion is more expansive than that. And our love is more generative than that. There is always room for love for both us and others. Those of us in the walls of this church when we gather together, and those of us outside, those of us in the borders of our own country, and those outside our borders. I invite you to consider how you can help both locally and abroad. It is difficult these days because we are forced to be socially isolated. And there are certain things that we would normally do that we just can't right now. But I do invite you to pray, support One Great Hour of Sharing if you're able, and consider any other way that you can help. When Jesus was entering Jerusalem on a donkey, people shouted, Hosanna. Hosanna comes from the Hebrew word, which means save us now, or save us, we pray. So quite literally, the people were throwing down their cloaks before Jesus and cutting palm branches and laying them in the street as he entered Jerusalem, crying out, save us, save us now, save us, we pray. And I imagine that many people today are saying those same words, crying out, save us. I know that refugees throughout the world are crying out, save us, we pray. Save us now, help us. And I wonder, will we hear their voices? And are we willing to do what we can, even though that's not as much as we usually are able to do? 
When Jesus entered Jerusalem and the people cried out, save us, I thought about what I had learned in church growing up about salvation. And for the first 20 years or so of my life, I thought of salvation strictly in terms of personal issues. I thought that as a Christian, God would save me from my personal sins and save me from my personal deficiencies and save me from anything personal that wasn't quite right or kept me from living the way God wanted me to live. But as I read the story of Jesus in Matthew, as he enters Jerusalem, it seems to me that personal salvation was not on the forefront of his mind. Let me tell you what I mean by that. First of all, I've been reading a little bit, again, of Warren Carter's book, Matthew and Empire. And in that book, Warren Carter explains and demonstrates that the whole Gospel of Matthew is about Jesus pointing out what the Roman Empire stood for and then saying a resounding no to all that it stood for and giving the world an alternative way of being, of being in the world and of being together. First of all, the Roman Empire stood for us versus them. There were the elite citizens who mattered, and basically everyone else was expendable, especially those people that didn't go along 100% with what the Roman Empire stood for. Jesus made it really clear that that was not his way. The Roman Empire stood for people matter, but only some people. Jesus stood for everyone matters. And as you read the first four chapters of Matthew's Gospel, this is seen so clearly. And as you read the rest of Matthew's Gospel as well, but as I was just reflecting this week on the first four chapters, it was so clear to me that women matter to God. That's what Jesus said. Even women with questionable character, women who might become pregnant before getting married. I'm talking about Mary. Women mattered to Jesus, and they mattered in his story. Children mattered. Even children who were born in poverty, even children who were born into families where both of the adults weren't the biological parents. Of course, I'm talking about Jesus here. Yes, women mattered, children mattered, refugees and immigrants mattered, people from other places, and their gifts were valued and remembered for millennia afterwards. Yes, I'm talking about the Magi, people from other places who believed in different things, who had different languages and different ways of being and different ways of worshiping. The poor people mattered, and the people that worked with their hands and scraped by from paycheck to paycheck, people such as fishermen. Yes, I'm talking about Jesus' disciples. They're right there. Jesus in Matthew called them and said, will you be a part of my mission, of my story? The sick people who had no health insurance and wondered if they would survive mattered to Jesus because we see Jesus approaching them, and them approaching Jesus, and Jesus healing them. Yes, indeed, everybody mattered to Jesus, even the people that the Roman Empire said didn't matter at all. I could go on and on, and I'm still in the first four chapters of Matthew. You know, if you really want to read the rest of Matthew, I invite you to do so, and you'll see that Warren Carter is absolutely right in his commentary. Everybody matters to God. And that's not what the Roman Empire was all about. But that's what Jesus was indeed all about. So let's move into Jerusalem. Jesus on the donkey 
with people shouting Hosanna, has now entered Jerusalem. And he is right at the entrance to the temple. And he goes in and he starts throwing over the tables of the money changers and shooing away all the people that are a part of an unjust economic system. And Jesus does this. All these people are there as people that are either representing the Roman Empire or going along with all that it stood for. And by the way, when you think about Jerusalem on that day, I want you to know that most of the power in the land resided right there in Jerusalem. And not just the political power, but the religious power, the economic power, the cultural power, that was the center of it all. And let's not forget that that's where people shouted out, save us. I often think that if Jesus really wanted to make salvation strictly personal, he would have gone away somewhere alone by himself and talked about it to God, prayed about it, or brought a couple of the worst sinners and talked to them about their need for personal salvation. But this one place in the gospel where people shouted out, save us, save us now, save us we pray, is at the center of power in the land. It's at the temple in Jerusalem. And that's exactly where Jesus makes a statement by throwing over the tables where money's being exchanged and throwing out the people that are trying to make money in the name of religion. Jesus made room for the true reason why the temple existed in the first place. He made room for people who wanted to pray. He made room for people who wanted to be healed. He made room for people who wanted to be made whole. He made room for the reign of God. And in order to make room, Jesus had to cast out those things that were in the way. So here we are inside the temple where Jesus has made room for prayer, for healing. And don't forget that in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel that we read this morning, that it is the children that he made room for. We know they're in the temple because Matthew says that they are the ones crying out, Hosanna, save us. Save us now, save us, we pray. So Jesus made room for the children as well. When I think of all that the Roman Empire stood for, it is clear to me that Jesus pointed out those things that were wrong with it and said that there is a better way. There is a much, much better way. Warren Carter, in his book, talks about Jesus as a prophet, a prophet sent by God who came to change the way that people were being together, the way that people thought, the way that people valued certain things. Jesus came as a prophet to change things. Those are the kinds of things that prophets did and continue to do. As a prophet, Jesus faced a lot of resistance, as prophets always do, and primarily, the resistance came from the people who had the power. And the resistance came from the people who primarily benefited from those in power. Jesus was ridiculed. The people in the power, the people who had the power, criticized him. They demonized him. They told people not to listen to him. They told people that he wasn't telling the truth as they lied. Jesus faced a difficult road as a prophet. And yet, even though he suffered and died because of his role as prophet, he continued right up to the end, sharing with people that they mattered. Everyone matters. 
you matter. And because of that, Jesus' message was heard loud and clear. And with all prophets, his message continued long after he was gone. Even today, we continue the words of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the calling of Jesus. Have you ever thought of yourself as a prophet? That's what you are. Because the church contains the prophetic calling and the prophetic nature of Jesus. We are called to continue his ministry of saying what's wrong with the world in giving the world an opportunity and an alternative to see something different and to live in a different way. How might you be a prophet in the world today? How might you assure somebody today that they matter? As I wrap up this time for us today, I want you to know that you indeed matter to God. I also want you to know that each and every person on this planet matters to God. And our role as the church is to not only remember that, but to shout those words out and to say Hosanna like the crowds on the road and the children in the temple. Hosanna, save us. Save us now, save us, we pray. Save us from all of the empires of today because the Roman Empire and all that it stood for continues to stand and it continues to be strong in many empires of today, in our country and in countries throughout the world. How might you be a prophet in saying, everybody matters? Everybody matters so much that I am going to show compassion to each and every child of God. Amen. If you have a bulletin for today's worship service, you can see at the end of the order of worship all of the prayer requests that we've been praying for during the week. And each week we like to add both joys and concerns. I want to tell you that last Sunday our deacons met online and we had a wonderful time of sharing joys with each other. And I invited the deacons to call people of the congregation and see if there's any other joys or requests that people have. By the way, one of the special things I want to do here for Easter Sunday next week is to share Easter joy. So I especially invite you to send in your joys so that we can have a joyful Easter celebration. We, of course, will continue to pray for all the needs of the world and of all the people in our lives that are suffering and that are sick and that are in pain. But because Easter is a day of joy, I don't want us to forget the joy of Easter and all the joyful things that have been happening in our lives. I also invite you, if you would like to, to dress up for Easter Sunday. Consider putting on your Sunday best, your Easter clothes, and take a picture of yourself, of 
your family, if you're with family, whoever you're with in your household, and send that into the church as well, because we would love to put a collage together for Easter. We'll probably get that out right after Easter. So on Easter Sunday, we would like to share the joys, and right after Easter, we would like to just show what we look like when we're dressed in our Sunday best for Easter. It's a difficult time because we can't be together but we can be together in spirit. And these are just a couple of ways to help us remember to do that. As the deacons met last week, some of them shared the joys that we have had in our own lives. And I first of all just shared that I am so grateful and have a lot of joy over the fact that my son Polani and his girlfriend Isabel have been with me for over two weeks now. They are keeping me company and we're participating together in meals and preparation and having meals together. And it's just an absolute delight to have them with me. Rose Tatiana is grateful for a conversation that she had with a total stranger as she was pumping gas and making sure she was keeping her distance of at least six feet away. And some of the other deacons said things like this, we are so joyful that we are learning Zoom. It's our online platform to have meetings. They said, we're so grateful to be using Zoom and seeing each other's faces and hearing each other's voices while we're isolated at home most of the week. Other deacons said, we are grateful for being in much better touch with our extended families, back home on the mainland especially, because we're in much better touch than we normally are. Other deacons said we are grateful for all of the members and friends of the church and the opportunities to reach out to everyone during this time of isolation and social distancing. During the week, our deacons, as I said, have been calling others. And uh, one of the people that sent in a joy was our friend Chris Molina. Uh, and many of you know Chris and his wife Michelle that worship with us often. Chris is grateful that some of his required volunteer hours for his degree have been waived because of the coronavirus. Whatever your joys are, I invite you to let us know so that we can continue sharing our joys with one another. Here now are some of our more recent prayer requests. First of all, for refugees and asylum seekers in Greece and in other parts of the world, I ask for your prayers for healing for Isabel, my son's girlfriend, because she slipped a little over a week ago and broke her arm and is in a cast. Steve Sparks requests prayers for healing for the Liebert family. Michelle Molina requests prayers for healing for her father, Jacques. Chris Molina also asks for prayers of encouragement for his brother and other seniors who are facing canceled graduation ceremonies and parties. Phil and Susan Rupitz have said basically ditto on behalf of their granddaughter who is a senior. And Jean Thompson asked for prayers for a successful quarantine for her daughter Ellen who recently returned home from Morocco where she was stranded with a church choir. Let us continue to pray for healing, comfort, and peace for all those infected with COVID-19, healing, wisdom, and support for healthcare professionals, including those who are members of our own church. Let us remember to pray for compassion, kindness, faith, patience, and well-being for all of the rest of us. And of course, safety for everyone who must travel and wisdom and compassion for our leaders at the national, state, and local levels, and of course, for international leaders as well. As we prepare ourselves now for prayer, I invite you to take a deep breath. And close your eyes if that's helpful. And take a moment of silence to give thanks for all that is good in the world. Think of all the things that bring you joy today and give thanks to God that so many blessings are still among us. And now let us consider the suffering in the world. Along with all the anxiety and fear that suffering breeds when we fail to face it 
and embrace it and confront it head on. In a moment of silence, pray to God as you wish for all those who suffer and for those who cause suffering. O oh God, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts, for you continue to bless us. For some of us, you've blessed us with families who are near, who live with us. For others, you've blessed us with families that we're able to communicate with electronically and by phone. God, in whatever ways we communicate with families and with loved ones and with friends. We are so grateful for them and for their love in our lives. God, we are also grateful for all of the new ways we are learning to communicate with one another, to share love and to get things done, to accomplish your mission and for many of us to work from home. Oh God, we are so grateful for this church, for the members and friends of the church who continue to reach out to one another. We're grateful for our deacons who continue to meet. We're grateful also for our council and for all of the people who are leaders of our church who continue to do what they can from home. God, we thank you for all of the unexpected blessings that have come during these weeks of social distancing and isolation. And now, O oh God, we lift up all of our requests that are new for refugees and asylum seekers, for those that have become sick and those who have been injured. God, we also pray for encouragement for those who had such high hopes in the weeks to come, including those seniors who were so looking forward to graduation ceremonies and parties. We also know that weddings have been canceled, that baptisms have also been postponed. We know, O oh God, that there are many things that churches have been planning to do, including our own church, for Easter Sunday. Oh God, as I think about our annual Easter egg decorating and our Easter egg hunt for the children, our picnic and our potluck that we do every Sunday, yeah, every Easter Sunday each year, and also for our Easter sunrise service, God, things are different now, and yet we grieve over the things we can't do. God, we present our griefs to you and we know that we can do so with continued joy in our hearts because we have just given thanks for the joys. There are new joys and many opportunities, different kinds of opportunities to give thanks. Oh God, for all those who are quarantined, we pray for their patience, for their healing, for their health, for their comfort. For all those that are infected with COVID-19, we pray for their healing and for comfort and peace. And for their family members who are so concerned about them, we also pray for their comfort and peace. God, we do pray for health, wisdom, and support for all the healthcare professionals that are out there in the world, many who are risking their own health to see to the needs of others. Oh God, for those who must travel, we pray for their safety and for peace for them as well. And God, for all the rest of us, we pray for compassion, kindness, faith, patience, and well-being. And God, as we human beings throughout the earth change the way we do things, we pray for Mother Earth. We pray that this brief break 
for her in many ways would be healing when less people are driving and fewer factories are operating and less parking lots and homes and buildings and roads are being built. God, we pray for the earth and we pray that we might pay attention to her these days so that in the days to come when all of this is over and we are no longer afraid of breathing the air that we're sharing with others, that we may take better care of the earth. Oh God, we know and have heard of friends and family members who have passed away these last few weeks, and this is an especially difficult time for them. And God, we pray that you would comfort those loved ones in your special way. And may we reach out as your people with words of comfort and condolences to all of them. And God, we also don't want to forget those who have been quarantined and confined for other reasons, people who have been in hospice care for many weeks and months even, people who have not been able to get out for a very long time. God, we pray for their comfort and their peace. Oh God, we give you thanks that you hear our prayers, and we give you thanks for Jesus, who brings all of our prayers to you. For it is in his name that we pray when we say together, our Creator, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The peace of God be with you. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Amen.